So welcome to Math 140 Business. Today is January 25. This is lecture number one. And this is um, statistics. And what I'm going to start with is actually um, not something that the book even mentions until about halfway through. Um, because I want to give you some motivation for why we're doing statistics and where we're going to get to at the end of the semester, or, or at least the second half of the semester, um, long before we get there. Uh, and the two goals, the two eventual target areas in a basic stack class are confidence intervals confidence intervals and um, hypothesis testing. These are our goals. We want to analyze confidence intervals. We want to analyze hypothesis testing. And in order to do both of those, we're going to need to learn this, which is going to require us first to learn this, which is going to require us first to learn this, and then this, and then this, and this. And back to chapter one is, of course, where we're going to begin. Um, but I want to I want to start with an example that kind of illustrates the idea of confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, and that is um, imagine that uh, I flip a coin, a fair coin, and I ask what the likelihood that the coin lands heads up would be. I'm hopeful that everyone here would agree without too much thought, what the likelihood of, or probability that the coin would land heads up would be, and that would be? 50, 50, 50%, 0.5, one half. There's various ways of, ex of expressing it verbally, but it all means the same thing, that there's an equal chance of it being heads and an equal chance of it being tails if we ignore the very negligible chances of uh, it landing on its side, if it's uh, hovering midair and never landing or spontaneous disintegration, we'll just assign all those likelihoods zero, pretend they don't exist and say it's 50-50. But what if instead of me using a coin from the United States government or from any other country, uh, I was going to use instead um, Maybe I am a woodcarver. It's not one of my skills. Uh, perhaps I whittled my own little coin, and I want to use this for the next Super Bowl and decide which team kicks off and which team receives. Um, would you assume going in that this coin that I have whittled is a fair coin? Is there any reason to think that it should be a fair coin? I mean, it might be a fair coin, but is there a reason to, to, do you have confidence that it's a fair coin, I guess is the question. And the answer I, I think would be, well, I mean, I'm not sure how good of a wood carver you are, but um, I mean, why should it be fair? If you, if you construct your own coin, who's to say it's 50-50? So what do you do in a situation like that where you're not sure if a coin is fair and you want to use it? How do you go ahead and test whether or not the coin is fair? What do you do? Um, I think you would just have to flip it like a crap load of times. Okay, I flip it a crap load, which is close to a crap ton. <laughs> I believe those are uh, similar um, yeah. numerical values. Um, but you would flip it a crap load of times and... Give me a number that falls in the region of crap load. I'm just curious what your definition of mine are. I would say maybe around 5,000 times. Okay, 5,000 flips. So someone, maybe you'll hire an intern to do it for you. You're going to have someone flip this coin 5,000 times. 
and uh, they're going to record the results. Now, if the results, so flip a uh, possibly, possibly fair coin, a crap load of times, and uh, for example, 5,000 and record the results. So let's look at some possible possible outcome. Suppose it was 2,500, 2,500. Suppose after 5,000 flips, 2,500 times it was heads, 2,500 times it was tails. Can you conclude definitively that the coin is fair? Yes. Definitively? Uh, well, let me ask you this question. I think you need more testing, no? Well, hold, well, hold on one second. Uh, let me ask you this question. If I, if I flipped an actual fair coin 5,000 times, is it possible that I would get 5,000 heads and zero tails? No. Yes. yes. Not probable. Possible. Yes. 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 Very low, but yeah. Possible, but very improbable, correct? Correct. So yes, boss. Uh, ah, see, that's a quick burner right there. So we have to differentiate between possible and probable. If I flip a coin 2,500, 5,000 times, and it's 2,500 heads and 2,500 tails, it doesn't guarantee that it's fair, but it's very probable that it's fair. Because if it wasn't fair, uh, that results would be quite unlikely. Does that seem like a reasonable conclusion? That 2,500, 2,500 falls under the realm of this coin is probably fair? Not definitively, but probably. Probably fair. And if I got zero heads and 5,000 tails, I would most likely fall under the category of probably not fair. Agreed? Well, where exactly is the cutoff between probably fair and probably not fair? Would 2,000, 3,000 fall into the probably fair or probably not fair scenario? What do you think? Probably fair. Okay. What about 1,500, 3,500? Um, um, like, yeah, probably fair. Nah, not fair. I'd say, you know, I'd nah. say probably not fair. So I think that's is, like too much, you know, like too big. Okay. So is there a specific number? where this number or more fair or this number and less not fair? And the answer, by the way, is yes. We're going to calculate this as the semester progresses. We're going to find the specific cutoff point where we say, if it's this to this, we make one conclusion. And if it's this to that, we make a different conclusion. And this is the idea of a confidence interval. A confidence interval is a range of possibilities where we are confident of an outcome. I am confident that the coin is fair if I fall somewhere in this interval versus I am confident that it's not fair if I fall outside of that interval. So confidence intervals are ranges of values for which we would like to have certain confidence of coming to a certain conclusion. Would having a bell curve or finding a standard deviation be helpful in this situation? Well, a bell curve would only be helpful if the distribution was what is called a normal distribution. This is actually what's called a binomial distribution, um, which is not something that we are technically covering in this course. However, normal distributions can be used to approximate binomial distributions so that 
the normal actually would be useful here in ways that we in this course will never have to worry about. Um, if you took a slightly more advanced statistics course <clears throat> or um, <clears throat> did a uh, study for the AP exam, I'm pretty sure the AP exam in, in high school because I've tutored people on that has the normal being used to approximate a binomial, but we're not going to have to worry about it in this class. Um, so you can ignore everything I said in the last two minutes. Um, so that's what a confidence interval. The, the idea of a confidence interval is I have no idea what the true value is. So I want to construct a range of values for that I will be confident of getting one outcome versus another. That's the idea of a confidence interval. What do I need to form a confidence interval? Well, I got to do, I got to come up with the math that allows me to construct this interval. I got to know what makes something a likely outcome versus not a likely outcome. And this is why we have like 10 chapters to go through before we're ready for confidence intervals, because we have to develop the math that's required. Of course, not all of those 10 chapters are going to be needed for that, but some of them will be. <clears throat> Hypothesis testing is a little different, although there's some overlapping scenarios where you can use either one. A hypothesis testing is can still be used in this example where we're testing to see whether or not the coin is fair. So I'm coming into the scenario saying, hey, here's my coin. I whittled this coin. I want you to use it for the Super Bowl. And you're like, first of all, who are you? Well, we're going to use that coin because we've been using it for years. But even if I did want to use your coin, um, is it fair? Let's test this. I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that the coin is fair. Your hypothesis is that the coin is not fair. Let's test it. Let's flip it 5,000 times. Let's get our results. And let's use the results to test one hypothesis versus the other and come to some kind of conclusion. So confidence intervals are when you have no idea what the value is and you want a range of values for which we can say, I'm pretty sure it's in there. And a hypothesis test is when you do have a, an idea of what the value should be, but you're gonna test it to see whether or not the data supports your argument. If you say my coin is fair, that's your hypothesis, and I get zero heads and 5,000 tails, the data is not really supporting your claim. Whereas if I get 2,500, 2,500, the data does support your claim. So either way, I'm going to use the data to determine whether or not I'm going to accept one hypothesis or more specifically reject one hypothesis versus the other. So the very beginning of the course is all about data. I can't do a confidence interval and I can't do a hypothesis testing without data. So the question is, how do I get data? How do I display data? How do I analyze data? It's all about data. In fact, the definition of statistics can be taken as the science of data. Statistics is the science of data. Collecting, analyzing, displaying, inferencing from, everything about data falls under the purview of statistics. And that is where we are going to begin this lovely adventure with chapter one. What color should I use for chapter one? I have a whole range of colors here. Can you guys see the colors? Which color should I pick for chapter one? I have a second, oh, wait, where'd it go? I have a second collection, it could be those. Blue, all right, blue it is. So chapter one, in the book is entitled Picturing Distributions with Graphs. Picturing Distributions with Graphs. This is where it all begins. And we start our, our chapter with the subsection entitled Individuals 
and variables. Individuals and variables. So chapter 14 in the textbook, which you'll all have uh, either an ebook. Uh, has anyone bought the book, by the way, like in the bookstore as preparation for this course? Is uh, anyone actually have it? From what I've seen, there was nothing listed at nothing the bookstore at for this course. Yeah. Pro probably because uh, it's online and they just kind of assume everyone will get it that way, um, which is which is definitely cheaper. Um, okay, that's good. So nobody can look ahead. I love it. Okay, so individuals. Individuals are the objects described by a set of data. Individuals may be people, animals, or in general, anything. I know sometimes we tend to think of the word individuals, like, hey, we're all individuals as people. But if I am uh, investigating um, the heights of buildings in downtown Los Angeles, then the individuals that I am studying would be the buildings. Uh, if I'm studying the luminosity of stars in the night sky, the stars are the individuals. Um, I mean, individuals can be anything. It's, it's just no, there's no bounds to the possibilities for what you might be referring to. But the individuals are the objects that are being described by the data. So if I ask for an individual, you don't say, oh, 17. That's not an individual. You might say, oh, that thing that I measured is 17 inches. The object is 17 inches long. 17 is not the individual. 17 inches is not the individual. The individual is the object that I'm looking at. It's the measurements, is the data that is being described. But the objects are the individuals themselves. A variable, a variable is any characteristic of an individual. Individual. So suppose, for example, I am interested in whatever reason, here's an example, I'm interested in whatever reason, in uh, cars on Ventura Boulevard. Uh, at 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. on January 25th, 2022. So I set up a camera, a high-speed camera that I can analyze the data afterwards. And for whatever reason, I'm interested in the cars that, um, I guess we should say, Ventura Boulevard and, uh, and Reseda just to give it an intersection and Reseda. Okay, at 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. on uh, January 25th, 2022. The cars are my individuals. They are the objects that I am studying. What are some variables that um, I might be recording? Whether or not I can get them from my high-speed camera or not, that's a whole other question, but what are some variables that I might be interested in? And for whatever reason, when I talk about, okay, so what do I have here? I have car color, two people said it right off the bat, right? Car color is certainly a, a, a variable. Uh, car make, we'll say make and model. I'm not sure that's two different things. Is make and model two different things or is it the same thing? I guess if it was different. different thing, make and model. So someone said the year, 
the year, year that it uh, was uh, manufactured, the year that it came on the market, car brand. What's a brand? Is that a is that a model? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's a little redundant, but uh, that's okay. All right. My father gave me some direction they were going there. to. Damn it, you missed my joke. Uh, uh, which direction? Okay, direction of travel. That's a good one. Direction of travel. Are they going east? Are they going west? North? South? Um, what the car runs on? Uh, gasoline versus, I guess, diesel or, or nitro. What's nitro? Is that a real thing? I feel like it's like a, a Nintendo game or something. Speed, how fast they were traveling. Uh, type of car, is that make and model? Is that different? Same thing. Same thing. Um, the sex of driver. Maybe, I don't know, just um, truck or sedan. Oh, okay. Um, that probably comes into the maker model. If I know the maker model. Uh, well, you know what? Okay, uh, um, fine. Um, we'll say type. Okay, so, and there are others. There's many others. Miles per hour. Age of driver, my MGH. What the f M miles per gallon. M miles, then there we go. Age of driver, right? There's many different um, variables. Uh, depends on your study. You might be interested in this, not that. Now, variables come in two basic types, categorical versus quantitative. So you can subdivide those even into further subdivisions. Um, but the two basic types of variables are quantitative and categorical. Now, some people erroneously think of quantitative as numerical and um, anything that's not quantitative as categorical. Um, but sometimes you can use numbers even when referring to categories. Not necessarily in the case of the car, although possibly. Actually, actually you, mm, yeah, okay. Um, in a way, let's go through some of these and decide whether or not they are categorical or they are quantitative. Whether or not as a variable, you're dividing all the objects into categories, this category, this category, this category, this category, and so on, or whether you are assigning each variable a numerical value. And it's important to understand that when you give them numerical values to be quantitative, you have to be able to do math on those numbers and get a result that makes sense, which doesn't always happen with numbers. Can anyone think in general of numerical situations Situations where you use numbers, where averaging numbers does not give you a useful quantity. Can anyone think of any? Not necessarily this example, but in general. Can anyone think of a situation where averaging numbers does not give a useful value? Uh, the only thing I can think of maybe is something that's like ever changing, maybe like gas prices maybe that's like due to inflation maybe. well even gas prices i mean if i if i measure like the gas price every day for the year i can still talk about what it was on the average right so uh a gas prices certainly uh i can average and i get a useful idea whether or not i, I can use that as something else but it, it still makes sense i'm looking for something where you can average numbers and get a result which just which just doesn't give you anything. Could you say like in Arizona can because it's always typically a dollar and it would give you anything? What was your example again? Uh, in Arizona can. In Arizona can? Yeah, since it's like always a dollar. You know what I'm saying? No, I don't know what you're saying. What's an Arizona can? Like the drink. No, I think I think he's trying to say like the fact that it's a dollar, like it stays the same. There's oh, no, no, really I mean, no average, well, like average, I guess, you know. Yeah, if, if something never changes, you really wouldn't use statistics for it because that's, you don't have to, you know, there's no need to, to analyze data when everything's exactly the same, right? Uh, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just, it's just you know, it's, 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 it's just unnecessary to use any tools of statistics for a situation where something does not change. 
Uh, Amaya, what do you mean by grains of sand? Do you like, like their weight? Because if I'm interested in the average weight of a grain of sand, I would probably take like a thousand of them and weigh them and average them. Right? But what about player points per game? Uh, certainly, I want to know on average what people score. I think that's a very important result. Oh, uh, what about the number of times uh, a dice rolls? Because it's still going to roll a number at random. Uh, it, it might roll a number at random, but still, I might be interested in determining whether the, the dice rolls are, are truly random by averaging the numbers and seeing what I get. Because if I rolled the dice a thousand times and it was truly random, I, it should average to be 3.5. No, I mean like um, when you roll a dice one time and it like it it uh, rolls on the on the table four times, five times, two times before it lands on the number. It doesn't matter because it's still going to land on a random number. That's true, but what if what if what I was interested in is um, how dice bounce, and I was curious for whatever reason uh, of of how they ricochet for some scientific study or not? I'm not saying the average person would care, but a person might care, right? So I agree. I would never care personally, but and you would never care, but but someone might care. So in the, even in that case, averaging at least whether I would use it or not or not, that's something else. Um, not, not something that's infinite because that's not numerical, but I'm going to give you one example, and then I want you to give me another example. Uh, I'll give you one right now. Everyone in the class has a cell phone, and every cell phone has a phone number. If we average those phone numbers, do we get something like the average phone number for the class? What, what does the average of phone numbers do for us? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely. There's nothing physical at all, useful or otherwise, about averaging phone numbers. Phone numbers are completely random and do nothing other than really just differentiate one phone from another. But there's nothing intrinsically useful about the specific number that you have from a mathematical perspective. I could just as easily or Alexander Graham Bell, when he invented the telephone, could have just as easily not used the numbers zero through nine, but rather 10 random symbols like triangle, square, circle, or whatever. And your phone number could be, oh yeah, my number is circle dash circle, triangle square, squiggly, you know, something like that. Numbers are irrelevant other than the ease of use. So phone numbers would be categorical not quantitative. There's nothing mathematically useful for phone numbers. Can someone think of anything else in daily life? Addresses. Uh, huh? A lot uh, of air we address. breathe. Social security. Uh, sorry, are two people at once. I, I, I Say it again. Home addresses. Home addresses. I was thinking about home addresses earlier. Um, you know, if you're on one block, then maybe that'd be useful because you can average the block. But yes, in general, home addresses, uh, if we average all of our home addresses, it just doesn't give us anything useful. Something else that I was thinking of, the average plate number. There we go. The license plates, right? If we all average our license plate numbers, that number means nothing. On the niece, high five or hand raise. What do you want? Average uh, the same thing. Yes. About the Zip code is a great one, yes? In your example, were we counting the numbers in a phone number or the contact in a person's phone? That's like what number, I'm saying. Like the number of contacts, you mean? Yeah, in, uh, in your example, which one were you? Uh, no, number of contacts, uh, that could be very useful for sociological purposes, like how many, how many degrees of separation, how many friends you have, things of that nature. The number of contacts might be very useful mathematically, but the phone number itself, is, is random. Right. Social security numbers, again, random. What about uh, Robert, like average? Robert, you go first, huh? Average uh, credit card numbers, you know? Average, well, we should test that. Everyone send me your credit <laughs> card numbers, And I will let you know uh, tomorrow. Um, if you don't hear from me, don't worry. Everything will be okay. Class will be in the next day anyway. Okay, anyway, so some of these are categorical. Some of them are quantitative. 
Um, it's important to differentiate which ones are which. So let's write a very uh, um, definitive definition, a categorical variable, a categorical variable places an individual into one of several groups or categories. A quantitative variable, quantitative variable takes numerical values and this is all in the book again, takes numerical values for which arithmetic operations such as adding and averaging makes sense. That's not how you spell sense. Makes sense. The values of quantitative variables usually have a unit of measurement. I see school ID numbers also on the list there. School ID is another great example. So we divide up our um, variables into two types, categorical and quantitative. And those divisions are, are, are not arbitrary. Um, and the reason is, is because our methods of displaying data is different for categorical variables versus quantitative variables. We actually display data in different ways. So for displaying categorical variables versus quantitative variables, does anyone know from either taking a stats course or just, you know, being alive for however many years you've been on this planet, um, which, what type of displays we use for either categorical or quantitative? There's a few a couple that we use for categorical. You've definitely seen them, but to associate this course to them might be a stretch, but you've certainly seen them sometime in your life. And if somebody says it and I or I write it, you'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, that's 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 so candlestick that's, charts. Which one? Candlestick charts. Candlestick charts. What's a candlestick chart? I've never heard of that. What's a candlestick chart? Uh, I'm probably using it the wrong term, but it's uh, you have the lowest, you have the highest, you have the mean, you have this, then you have the the standard deviation. Uh, I, I have never used that, heard that term. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It's just not something I'm familiar with. I'm probably using it uh, the wrong name. Not necessarily. It's mainly used for stocks. Yeah. Well, um, I I. I'm very much not a financially minded person. That's why I'm a teacher and I make no money. Um, but um, again, I, I've never heard that term, but Philip has. Um, so we're not gonna use it in this class. Um, and if you wrote it on a test, I, I can't say I'd mark it wrong, but it's certainly not what I'm after. Um, but the two that are normally used for categorical variables are pie charts and bar graphs. Anyone here ever see a pie chart? Yes. Right, pie charts. You've seen these before, right? These are not uh, new for anyone. Um, hopefully, 
notice, you know, when you have a pie chart, um, so each uh, slice of the pie represents a category and the sizes of the slices uh, as proportions of the total area of the circle represent the um, percentage of the individuals that fall in that category, right? So this is just, I just did a Google search for pie chart and a bunch of images came up. I just picked one at random. They are all like this. Uh, the different colors are necessary to help uh, differentiate the slices. Um, having them in order from biggest to smallest, obviously they didn't do that here because the smallest one is, well, the two smallest ones are kind of not even next to each other, the other and the uh, American Indian for this particular one. But I think a pie chart is pretty self-explanatory. I, I hope. Um, I mean, the book doesn't even really spend much time on it. it it's, it's fairly self-explanatory. The other one, uh, the other one is a bar graph. Okay, bar graphs also, I'm pretty sure. Uh-oh, okay, I had a bad, I'll try this one. Okay, so here's a bar graph. For this particular example, favorite type of movie, we asked a bunch of people, hey, what's your favorite type of movie? Comedy, action, romance, drama, sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Not sure what my favorite type of movie is. I mean, I kind of like, you know, anything that's good. I guess it could have a category of like a good movie. I don't know. Anyway, uh, bar graphs, again, pretty self-explanatory. You put a bar, a vertical bar, one for each category. The bars are separated. Um, the, the vertical axis is the frequency, how many, type, how many times each one occurs. Sometimes it'll be a relative frequency, what percentage of time each one occurs, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, you wanna have the widths the same all, you don't wanna visually skew your results. If you have one that's wider, it'd be like, oh, wait, is that more important? Is that bigger? You, know, you wanna be able to visually see what's going on. Uh, bar graphs and pie charts are just the two simplest ways of doing that. So those are what we use for categorical variables, but they are not what we use for quantitative variables. What do we use for quantitative? Anyone know? Line graph. Uh, what do you mean by a line graph? You mean like one of those things that kind of, you know, looks like, you know, like a, a EKG or something like that? That's actually called a time plot um, because you're measuring actually one, um, you're measuring one individual over time versus a bunch of individuals. But yes, one of them is a histogram. Uh, there's also a dot plot. There's a stem plot, oftentimes called stem and leaf plot. Um, those are the three that we're going to be using in this course. I don't think we're going to be using anything else. Time series, we will, oh, scatter plot we will use, but scatter plot is when we get to, um, I guess we should include it. So uh, I'll write scatter plot. That's going to be like two chapters later, but this is a two variable situation when we're actually seeing if one variable relates to another variable whereas the histogram the dot plot and the scatter plot are just ways of displaying information from a single variable um yeah so um Question so far, before we go, uh, 7.53, the next section is gonna take us a while and I don't wanna to do too much today because it's only the first day. 
So we'll probably stop here. Um, uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what are uh, histograms and stem plots? Well, you're in luck because you got to always leave the audience wanting more. Uh, exactly what we're going to cover first thing tomorrow. I mean, Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. So this yeah. is your you're probably not going to be able to sleep tonight because you'd be like, oh my God, I can't. <laughs> uh, I mean, Google, but. <laughs> Google. Then why ask me if you could just ask Google? Oh, well, because you're the professor. So you know, I, 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 I can't argue with you on that one. Yeah. Okay. So we will do all of it because you're the boss. See, see, that's what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, we will do this next time. Uh, we will finish chapter one, which means the first homework will not be due in 10 days because we didn't finish the first chapter yet. Um, but we will certainly finish the first chapter on Thursday and move on to the second chapter, which means the first homework will be due the weekend after. Um, and I'll have it all assimilated by tomorrow so that you can access it directly from the Canvas page. Now, just so you know, you will have to buy an account. Uh, every course in college, you have to buy a textbook. In this case, you have to buy the textbook slash homework program. This is beyond my control. Um, I, I, they tell me what book to use. They tell me what program to use. This is, this is just part of the course. Um, so, And you have to. You have to buy the homework program. You can't not buy it. If you don't do the homework, you will not succeed. Um, and the book comes with the homework. Yes, uh, Peter. Do you know if uh, CSUN's doing, um, like in this situation, they're providing it for free for freshmen? So I will, I will pass along the email about, uh, about that, which I haven't, to be honest, really read thoroughly. I don't know exactly whether it will be free versus a lower cost versus nothing that you can use, but I will pass it along. Thank you. Okay. And there was another hand raised, or was that a, a redundant, reiteratory and repetitive question? See, that was funny. That was that was that was hilarious. See, I used um, similar words that meant the same thing and was redundant. No, no, I thought you got to explain it. Just doesn't work. You know what? I'm done. I'm done. Um, but anyways, are there any questions on anything we did today? Yes, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony. How do I know that name? Mark Anthony. Singer. 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 Oh, yeah. Singer. Yeah. Are you him? Oh my God. Do we have a celebrity in the class? Oh, I wish. Oh yeah, me too. All right, go ahead. <laughs> um, do you know by any chance how much the um, the book costs? I mean the uh, the program costs. I maybe? believe it's eight hundred dollars. Okay, oh my I'm, god that's a joke no way jesus oh, christ no, i'm like i'm like <laughs> it's, like, it's like probably like 100 bucks or something like that okay for sure maybe 200 300 max no more than 400 possibly five <laughs> six, six tops for sure no, okay bet. no i don't know that's like 100 dollars. okay thank you I feel like rain man okay yes any other questions professor so um right now the best thing to do is just set up the account and get it ready for next for Thursday, I, when you yeah, wait for me. Week. Wait for me to pass along the information, which I'll probably do tomorrow because I'm too lazy to do it now, and um, I have to hear back from from the people who work for the launchpad company so that I can integrate the homework for the course and everything will be set up. Um, but it it'll should be up by tomorrow. Um, okay, cool. So will this be on? The, mother. <laughs> ah! Yes, it will be on the test. In fact, this will be the entire test. So just. Uh, Anyway, is the Zoom recording going to be on Canvas? No, the Zoom recording is going to be on my on my YouTube site. So, so, um, thank you. Oh, sorry, something in my throat there. Um, so, um, the YouTube link is on Zoom. Please like and subscribe, and uh, I will post this. It takes like an hour or so. How much do you earn? Nothing yet until I have enough subscribers. So come on. All right, so I'm like, I'm like at 12, okay? And it's like three years. So we got to up this thing, okay? Got to all subscribe and like, go back through all my videos, like every one of them. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, my channel is called MCPC Learning. MCPC Learning. Math, Chemistry, Physics, 
chess. Speaking of chess, I always have a rule every semester that um, if anyone wants to play me at chess, if you beat me, you get an automatic A. But if you lose, you get an automatic F. So. What about per- checkers? Not nah, checkers, checkers, please. Do you prefer lead chess or chess.org? Uh, I do chess.com. My website oh. is chess.com. It's a risk I'm willing to take. Oh, I like that. I actually had one guy one semester. He's like, listen, I can't, I can't do it for a grade, but I'll do it for a steak dinner. Whoever wins, the other one takes them to a steak dinner. I'm like, fine. I'm telling you right now, nothing beats a free steak. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It was awesome. Have you played chess against yourself? Uh, backgammon, chess, chess, huh? No, I don't play backgammon. I mean, it's too many. Anything with dice is, it's, it's, uh, oh, I'll play with time controls. I have a clock. 100%. Cards. I used to play when I was younger, hearts and spades. I don't know if you guys play those things anymore. 